Welcome to the Vast Hacker Archives, a new series that uncovers the aha moments that hackers and researchers have had over the course of their careers. I'm Jay Ballou, CISO at Avast, and today's guest is Ava Galperin, Director of Cybersecurity at the Electronic Frontier Foundation and Tech Advisor at the Freedom of the Press Foundation and Callisto. Eva Galperin is one of the key personalities when it comes to protecting our digital freedom, especially of more exposed and vulnerable populations, such as people in abusive situations, journalists, and activists. She's a well-known researcher on malware and nation-state spyware and a pioneer in the fight against stalkerware. She has launched the Coalition Against Stalkerware, which Avast is a proud member of. Thank you for joining us today, Eva. Thank you for having me. So, like, let's start with, you know, all of the amazing work that you've done on Stalkerware. How did you start? You know, you dedicated a huge portion of your career to this. So, like, where did it begin? Well, kind of by accident. So, uh, I uh, once upon a time in the before times, I was, you know, a, a regular malware researcher and I cared about APTs. I spent a bunch of time tracking uh uh, sort of state actors that were targeting journalists and activists. And at the time, uh, a lot of the work that was being that was being published on APTs really was focused on the stuff that was um, that was technically sophisticated. People cared what the Five Eyes were doing. People cared about what Russia was doing or Israel or you know if they if they wanted to get you know really crazy with it, maybe like North Korea or China. Um, but not a lot of people talked about places like Ethiopia or Vietnam or Lebanon or Kazakhstan. And the reason for that was because frequently these were not countries that were uh, that were creating their own malware in order to target uh, journalists and activists. What they were doing is they were buying tools from, uh, from other uh, people and other companies and uh, they, were, they were using those. So I spent a bunch of time working on that and uh, I wrote reports about you know, Syria and Lebanon and Kazakhstan and, uh, and Vietnam mm -hmm. uh, and a few others. And uh, I spent probably about three years writing APT reports for, for EFF and uh, helping us figure out how we were going to uh, help protect uh, journalists and activists who were increasingly being targeted by uh, by this kind of stuff. And while I was doing this work, I discovered that uh, one of the uh, researchers with whom I was publishing all of this stuff uh, was outed as a serial rapist. And, you know, so I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm reading about how this guy that I work with is a serial rapist. And there's a um, there's an interview with one of his alleged victims. And I think it was Vice or The Verge. I'm fairly certain it was Vice. And uh, the emphasis in this story is very much on how scared uh, the, the alleged victim was and how scared all the other witnesses were to come forward. And the reason for that was because this guy had allegedly uh, threatened to uh, compromise all their devices, to compromise their laptops, to compromise their phones. And uh, because he was this sort of badass security researcher with a you know, big reputation for taking on uh, nation state actors, uh, they believed him. And I was so mad uh, how frightened he had made these people uh, through his abuse that I tweeted that if you were a woman who had been uh, sexually assaulted by a hacker and you were worried about uh, your devices, that you could reach out to me and I would make sure that they would get a forensic analysis. Mm -hmm. um, 10,000 retweets later, <laughs> I had started a project and uh, sort of against my will. And I still get messages about about this tweet. I still get messages uh, every day. And do you still get messages so from victims? From victims every single day. Uh, there hardly a day goes by when I do not hear from somebody who uh, has seen the, you know, who has seen the TED talk or who is familiar with the coalition against stalkerware or who has seen like a screenshot of the tweet somewhere on Tumblr or heard through word of mouth that I could help them. And I hear from people every day. So this is both tragic and compelling at the same time. And how do you simply deal with it in terms of volume? Because you can't really analyze every single piece of diverse uh, reporting that comes your way, or can you? 
like most engineers, I am a lazy engineer. And so once I've been asked to do something two or three times, I start thinking about, you know, hey, how do I script this? Uh, and unfortunately, you can't script helping uh, sort of uh, victims of sexual abuse. But what you can do is you can look at the problem and you can see like where where can I get the most bang for my buck? Mm -hmm. And so at the time, I think about three years ago, um, I, I noticed that most of the people who were coming to me were, uh, did not have malware installed on their on their devices. Their biggest problem was account compromise. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of great solutions for account compromise out there. I mean, some of them better than others, mm -hmm. but uh, even, even SMS 2FA is you know, some uh, protection against having uh, your account hijacked. So uh, I had already contributed to EFF Surveillance Self-Defense, which is our guide to privacy and security online. And there were entire sections in there about uh, SMS and about 2FA and how to, you know, how to use a, you know, how to, how to use a YubiKey mm -hmm. and all of these other things, you know, that we consider to be quite basic, but which are really like not out among the, you know, consumer populace just yet. Um, and so I could just point people to that. And that was essentially scripting my problem uh, out of existence. But then I was left with the people who actually had malware on, uh, on their computers or on their phones or on their tablets. And I discovered that it was actually very hard uh, to, uh, to detect it. And the reason for that is because we have this whole industry. We've got the antivirus industry uh, that's supposed to be there uh, in order to detect bad stuff on your device. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that the malware industry was actually not very good at detecting stalkerware, uh, the, specifically the class of software that was being uh, sold commercially for the purpose of spying on a partner or a loved one or someone in your family uh, or to you know catch your partner cheating or something like that. Um, often when when we talk about stalkerware, somebody will just pipe up and they'll say, well, this is this is just a re, uh, you know remote administration tool. Mm -hmm. And uh, in some ways it is in the same way that like all hammers are the same. This is just a bashy thing. Um, but uh, the big difference is the way that it's marketed and uh, how easy it is to purchase and to use. So the idea is that you do not have to be an engineer in order to do this sort of spying. You can actually be a person with very little technical background and uh, with only a very brief window of access to the other person's device. You can do a tremendous amount of damage. Um, and so I reached out to the AV companies and I said, hey, why are you guys doing such a bad job of, uh, of detecting this stuff? And they gave me various excuses, which are not particularly interesting. As part of the Coalition Against Stalkerware, I wanted to bring in AV companies and get them committed to doing a good job of finding this stuff um, flagging it and letting people know that this is on their device so that they can then go ahead and make an informed decision about possibly removing the stalkerware from their device. Uh, one of the reasons why I caution uh, companies who are helping people to understand that they have stalkerware on their device from just automatically removing it is that um, there are some ways in which stalkerware is a little bit different from uh, like ransomware or your run-in-the-mill run crimeware. And one of them is that the abuser is unlikely to just move on when, uh, when you push back just a little bit. And so it really needs to be up to the person who is, uh, who is the victim of the abuse uh, mm -hmm. to decide how much of a risk they're willing to take by alerting their abuser that they that they know this stuff is on their on their device uh the by thwarting them by removing uh the uh, the stuff from their device um, but at least they can make an informed decision. And that's really the most important thing. I'm, I'm a big fan of keeping uh, all of the decision making in in the hands of uh, of the survivor whenever possible. As a Navy company uh, and a member of the coalition, um, I have to tell you that we saw an incredible spike of stalkerware uh, with the beginning of the lockdown period. And I wanted to know how you, um, I mean, we saw this with our own numbers. I just want to know how you saw that and how you 
uh, because you have a collective uh, lens rather than our singular one? Well, uh, first, I would I would caution people to keep in mind that um, there there are definitely there there are researchers out there that I try to work through in the coalition against stalkerware in order to get a broader uh, idea of what's going on in the sort of you know full stalkerware ecosystem. Uh, what I see is a self selecting sample. I see the people who come to me. So I try very hard uh, if I'm going to make generalizations based on that to at least make people make sure that people understand that um, I am generalizing from a, a small and self-selecting sample of people who know who I am and know to come to me in the first place. Um, but of those people, there, uh, there was definitely a spike in, uh, in victims of abuse who were not living with their abusers. And so their abusers were uh, sort of intimidated and frightened by lockdown and yeah. uh, were much more determined to sort of try to, to keep their uh, victims under control. Uh, and so I saw a lot of that. Um, I also saw a spike in uh, in the use of stalkerware around the time that uh, that lockdown would start to relax a little bit. Uh, mm. And I, um, as far as I can tell, these are often um, abusers who are living with their victims uh, who have you know are no longer trapped in the house with their with yeah. their victims, and therefore really want to know what they're doing outside the house. Uh, so we're seeing uh, a lot of that. And I also wanted to emphasize that this is not just a, a U.S. or European yeah. problem, yeah. Uh, that I, I see um, lots and lots of abuse in, uh, in Southeast Asia, in India, in, uh, you know, in Russia. But again, uh, I, this, is, this is a worldwide problem. This is not just a, you know, rich people with iPhones problem. No, absolutely not. And it's really funny you mentioned the worldwide aspect of it because we had seen something like a 90% rise in the United Kingdom, but also in Japan, uh, relative to geography in the other Asian states. But we also saw something really interesting. Um, uh, we noticed that the we have this project called apklab.io, which is where researchers can like look at Android apps and look at permissions. And we um, accidentally classified um, an application as stalkerware, but what it really turned out to be was the Iranian COVID-19 tracing app. <laughs> and I know how it would be difficult to tell the difference. <laughs> and the reason was because of the excessive permissions that were demanded by the app. But I think this brings us to a really interesting dilemma that purely on the telemetry alone, it's difficult to make the right assessment for any AV company. So it, it really requires you to have some level of understanding of the company and the intention behind the tooling, especially since it's like a user, um, uh, not initiated, but a user interactive thing to get the thing installed in the first place on the device. What are successful strategies you would deploy, uh, especially with your skills as a malware researcher, to know the difference? I mean, honestly, the very first thing that I would do is once, uh, once you identify the product, uh, just Google it. Mm -hmm. Go see how they're advertising themselves. Go see what they're telling people who are potentially going to give them money. And that tells you an awful lot about the potential targeting. And you'll see a lot of sort of lawyer weasel language in, uh, you know, in the terms of service that will say things like, you know, uh, even though we give you the power to spy on your partner, don't do this without their permission. And don't break any laws. And uh, the the real key is often the language that's in the advertising, because the language in the terms of service, which no one reads, uh, is often designed just to uh, cover the company's ass. What further steps do you think uh, need to be taken by both the cybersecurity industry as well as governmental organizations to really put a stop to this, to eradicate this software? Well, uh, we've actually seen some really exciting uh Great steps. Uh, the first is that uh, Google has uh, has taken some action against the uh, stalkerware companies that uh, that use Google AdWords in order to advertise. Uh, stalkerware is. Uh, against the rules uh, for, you know, against the, the content rules in the Google Play Store and also in, uh, in uh, Apple Store. Uh, so that's good news. Uh, they don't always do the greatest job of policing, uh, 
Uh, and so it is really important for them to be a little bit more careful and a little more on the bottle in, in keeping this stuff out of their stores. Um, and that's also, that's really effective for Apple, which has, you know, this sort of, you know, gated community that I am, uh, that I'm extremely critical of in other circumstances, but which is useful in, uh, for, for their security model. Um, but Android which I uh, often support and a bit, am a big fan of uh, because they have not centralized uh, to one store and you can sideload content, uh, definitely has a much broader ecosystem of, um, of malware that uh, for, for everybody to look at and enjoy. Uh, and so even if you uh, kick something out of the Google Play Store, that doesn't necessarily mean that it can't be installed on uh, on an Android device. And you can install other things on, on an iPhone, um, but you have to jailbreak it first. And there are you know, lots of ways in which to check to see whether or not your, uh, your phone has been covertly jailbroken. So that bit is also very important. Uh, so there's there's a lot to do in the in the sort of advertising and keeping it out of the stores field. Um, but even if you do manage to keep it out of the stores, often the way that these APKs are uh, are downloaded onto a device is just they will um, the uh, makers of the stalkerware will simply put up a website and they'll say exactly. you know, just download it download it from here. You can go ahead sideload it, and as long as you allow sideloading on on your device, you can install uh, this APK. Um, so there, there are ways, uh, in which we can, we can still counter these things. And that's really where, where AV comes in. This is where AV can be the most useful because this is the sort of thing that we are seeing mostly in, uh, in Android devices and specifically in older Android devices, which are, uh, which are harder to keep updated. Um, so there's, there's that problem as well. Um, and then, the the other issues that we're that we're really facing are staying up to date on the signatures of all of the latest malware, um, and this is the same sort of cat and mouse game that you get with uh, with APTs or with crimeware. You just need to have you know some researchers at your AV company who are devoted entirely to looking for this stuff and making sure that your you know that your signatures are up to date. Um, and the companies are, of course, constantly renaming themselves and reskinning their product and ch you know, changing things in order to avoid uh, detection by a uh, AV companies. But at least this is, uh, this is an extremely familiar dance for AV. Um, and in some ways, it's even easier to, uh, to find and detect stalkerware than it is to hunt APTs because you can just, again, just Google for it and follow the ads. Uh, they have to go find the their uh, their users somewhere, whereas APTs are all hiding. There, there's no like you know here's your your five five eyes uh, malware store uh, where you too can install five eyes malware in order to spy on your partner. Um, so there are some big differences there. Uh, there are also some legal approaches that uh, that we're thinking about taking. Um, one of the things that I try to be really careful about is when people say, well, you know, isn't, isn't this stuff illegal? Shouldn't it be illegal to have, uh, you know, for, to, to write stalkerware, to sell stalkerware, to buy stalkerware, to use stalkerware? And uh, the answer is it's complicated <laughs> um, because it depends on where you are and, uh, you know, what jurisdiction you're in and who you're buying from and what you're doing with it. Uh, and simply making stalkerware illegal uh, runs up against uh, a lot of very serious uh, sort of uh, legal protections for security researchers like myself. Uh, and for people who build uh, remote administration tools and who do all kinds of things that are really good for the internet and very good for security. So I try to emphasize uh, going after the people who download and um, you know, purchase this stalkerware and install it non-consensually on somebody else's device. No, I think that's a perfect uh, explanation. I think the, the question that we need to ask is, um, what things could we do to make it easier to share that information? I'm thinking of like notice and takedown like strategies, which do actually require some proof of non-legality of the thing that you're doing in order to actually issue and follow through with the notice and takedown. 
Um, like if it is a website and there is side loading, that would be a potential alternative. And you could do that with the CERT community that the coalition also shares, like we used to do in the olden days of IP blacklisting, that we have a rather current database of information of which things can you block and why, and then uh, per potentially pertaining to specific geographies and not others. Would that be something we could do? Possibly. Um, but I do think that uh, rather than than sort of taking the, the CERT approach, and especially uh, I'm very, very leery of blocking websites, um, even potentially malicious uh, websites, only because I have a lot of experience in the intellectual property wars. And I have seen the uh, website blocking be used against uh, against people who are putting things up for uh, that are entirely within the realm of fair use. Uh, or who are putting up security research, or who are you know, doing perfectly legitimate journalism. Uh, so rather than than giving us those powers, which I am very leery of, uh, I really have a strong emphasis on detection. Uh, and I think that the the next best step would be once you have detected the malware um, to be able to provide enough information to the end user that they can go to law enforcement and law enforcement can then go on and identify the person who purchased this malware and uh, make sure that they face some consequences for having covertly installed it. And uh, this is one of the reasons why the uh, Coalition Against Stalkerware is working with Interpol right now uh, in order to do some training. Because right now, if you are a victim of, uh, of stalkerware and you discover there's stalkerware on your, on your device and you go to your uh, local police or you go to the FBI or you go to Interpol, um, you will not necessarily come across someone who understands what is happening to your device or what to make of this information, uh, much less somebody who will you know, actually go and find the person who purchased the software and you know, uh, make sure that they face some sort of consequence. Uh, it is more likely that you will be you know, essentially ignored uh, or gaslit or uh, that they will not understand the information that you are bringing them. And so I think that training is really the most important next step, reaching out to law enforcement so that when they see the, uh, the messages that the AV companies bring up, uh, when you have this sort of thing installed on your uh, on your device, they know what to do next and they can be effective partners instead of just making it easier for the perpetrator to to do their thing uh, by continuing to ignore this problem. Because right now, law enforcement is largely not helpful. I think it's it's a reflection, actually, of the global state of you know privacy and security today. And it's simply like the lens that I have is that very often they tend to be overwhelmed and understaffed in order to cope with the with the size of the problem. So could I just ask you, you know, you, you do so much on privacy and free speech as well. What's your opinion in terms of the state of the global privacy today for average people? Well, uh, there are. Ever since the 90s, when uh, when we were informed uh, by by the CEO of Sun Microsystems, uh, long dead, that uh, that privacy was dead and we should get used to it, um, I that have been yelling that privacy is not dead because if privacy was dead, governments uh, wouldn't have to keep trying to kill it all the time. I would have way less to do every single day if privacy was already dead. Um, there, there is still so much for all of us to do. And probably the biggest threat that we're still facing is the push for, uh, for backdoored end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, oh, for yeah. For end-to-end yeah. encrypted messaging. Like every time there is a terrorist attack, every, um, except for January 6th for some reason, um, there is, or every time there is um, a discussion of uh, sort of, child porn or anything bad happening online, the very first thing that you will hear is these people are communicating using end-to-end -end encryption. And so we must be able to break their end-to-end -end encryption in order to fight crime. And not only is this not necessary because you can break endpoints, um, but it is uh, incredibly dangerous to 
uh, the sort of basis of all of our communications, because if end to end encryption uh, has a backdoor for law enforcement, then that backdoor is actually open for everyone. And the chances that somebody else will come along and exploit that backdoor are extremely high. And the, the stories that we have heard about O'Days and vulnerabilities just in the last few weeks mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, yeah. vulnerabilities being out there and then just seeing multiple yeah. actors piling on in order to take advantage of them uh, should give us some idea of how to assess that risk. And it is much higher than governments keep trying to tell us. So I had a recent chat with Ian Levy, who is the director at um, the, you know, the UK government for uh, doing all the cool stuff around this area. And he had a very specific um, request, which was to institute something called the ghost protocol. And the ghost protocol basically allows you in an encrypted communications to take one side and then basically create another sort of party uh, enabled to the chat, like a sort of group chat functionality without issuing notifications. And this was a very, you know, kind of specific proposal that was initially designed for WhatsApp, but then you would have like multiple parties in the group where uh, the other parties wouldn't necessarily know about this third party that was joining. Um, what do you think about protocols like the ghost protocol? Um, I think that's just another backdoor. Stop it. Stop it. It does not matter what you call the damn thing. <laughs> We need to get you can call it a ghost, you can yeah. call it a side door, you can call it a golden key. As long as there is a way to get that information covertly without um, compromising the endpoints, then you are creating a vulnerability that can be used uh, by other people and that will be used by other people and that will be very powerful. And no matter how much you insist that you will be able to protect it, um, I have seen the internet and <laughs> the, the track record is bad. <laughs> And the the potential outcomes for doing uh, for for having this go wrong and having it go out of control are also extremely bad because you cannot put the genie back in the box. Uh, once a once a backdoor is out, or once the ability to you know to to ghost into conversations becomes available to some other party that is not law enforcement or to law enforcement that you don't trust. Like even if you trust the U.S. government or EU governments, maybe you don't trust the Russian government or the Chinese government or the Ethiopian government. Um, not all governments are created equal, uh, and certainly not all governments are good and benign. Um, so there is that, and the Ghost Protocol absolutely doesn't change that in any way. And so. I, I love this. So let, let me be clear. I perfectly agree with you on all of this. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I see happening also in Europe is changes in legislative frameworks that very specifically uh, claim to fully support strong cryptography, fully support end-to-end -end encryption, with the exception of uh, the moments, you know, these very specific instances where there needs to be um, a, a judicial basis for law enforcement uh, being able to use their already granted powers to go and weaken cryptography for the sake of a particular case. Um, are there any alternatives other than just uh, attacking the endpoint that you would uh, use to dissuade uh, these makers of this new legislative frameworks uh, to say, hey, look, don't do that, do this. I don't understand why they feel that they need more methods to do a thing that they can already do, that law enforcement is already capable of. Probably the best example of this is the FBI's insistence that Apple needed to break uh you know, that Apple needed to break its encryption in order to get into the San Bernardino iPhone. Uh, in the end, it simply, they simply used a, you know, a commercial service uh, in order to get into the phone. So all of that whining about how they really needed to break end-to-end -end encryption in order to protect all of us, and it was really important just this one time, uh, was, was simply not true. Uh, these powers exist. The reason why... Um, governments and law enforcement keep asking for more power is because they want it to be easy. They want it to be cheaper. They want it to be turnkey. And that's not the case when you tell people that they have to uh, compromise endpoints because you're constantly up against the you know, latest version of, uh, of the OS. 
Uh, and I don't think breaking into endpoints should be trivial. <laughs> I am a security person. I kind of think we should have security. <laughs> So I love this case. I love the San Bernardino case. Uh, it's a perfect example for how stuff can go terribly wrong. I like to call it the three musketeers principle, which is that you are doing all of this work for one target, but this one target could bring down the security for all of the rest of us. So it's all for one and one for all, literally. Um, and the reason that it's because that this was so specifically poignant to me was because of the fact that what they actually were after were the code signing keys. They asked Apple for the bloody code signing keys, which would potentially be letting them compromise every single device all over the planet rather than the one of, that they needed for the target in the San Bernardino shooting. And you're right, they finally bought, I think for a million dollars, um, a zero day from NSO group, if I'm not mistaken, um, in Israel uh, for the vulnerability that allowed them to get back. But they also had alternatives that they never explored when they already you know, presented a judicial case to say, give us uh, these code signing keys to Apple. It, anyway, brilliant example. Um, so moving you know, to this year and the craziness we saw around uh, the US elections, we saw so many discussions about the difference between freedom of speech and like the need uh, to take responsibility really for everything that was said online. Um, and there is a fine line between holding people accountable and censorship. So what would your take on this be? Well, uh, I am essentially a civil libertarian in the sense that I think civil liberties are a good idea. Uh, and one of those is freedom of speech. Um, but freedom of speech is a um, is a right that is hugely misunderstood online uh, in that freedom of speech does not mean freedom of consequences for your actions. And it certainly does not mean freedom of consequences for your speech. Uh, and what we saw, I think, uh, earlier earlier this year were a lot of complaints from people who were experiencing consequences for their speech. So I have very limited uh, sympathy. Um, having said that, we did also uncover one of the great sort of weak links of the Internet, which is that uh, even though the internet is supposed to be this huge sprawling thing, which is resistant to censorship, it has a few really interesting bottlenecks, uh, which include services like Cloudflare. Uh, and when services, you know, sort of these these you know, backend services start uh, start banning you, then it can have a tremendously uh, like outsized effect. Uh, for example, if uh, you are the president of the United States and you have been banned from Twitter, uh, you can turn around and you could have gone to something like, you know, Gab or Clubhouse or any one of the other like many social media sites that uh, that exist on the Internet. Um, but if your website is no longer being supported by Cloudflare, <laughs> you don't have a lot of other choices. Um, likewise, uh, you know, we're concerned about financial censorship, uh, even, you know, going back to, you know, the, the WikiLeaks case more than, more than 10 years ago, we started seeing pressure from us senators on companies like PayPal to stop taking, uh, donations on behalf of WikiLeaks. And that was, uh, you know, that had this you know, sort of tremendously outsized censorship effect. On one hand, uh, I I think that we you know did not go overboard, uh, but on the other hand, I am really concerned about uh, censorship by the people who control the internet choke points, uh, and I think it's really important to hold them accountable for what they do. If I recall correctly, the CTO of uh, of Cloudflare wrote a uh, wrote a blog post after he decided that he was no longer going to support, uh, was it uh, Stormfront? So was, I, I, the Daily Stormer, that was oh, it. Oh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I get my Nazi organizations mixed up. There are a lot of them. <laughs> and uh, so Cloud, Cloudflare decided that they were no longer going to support the Daily Stormer. And uh, he wrote a blog post, and it was essentially, so today I got up and I decided that this site shouldn't be on the internet anymore. And on one hand, uh, it is good 
which has been very uh, influential and has been behind many bad things, is no longer on the internet. On the other hand, I don't think any one person should have that kind of power. Uh, and I agree with the second part of his statement, which is that we should be really concerned when just one person has that kind of power, uh, because that person is not always going to be good. They're not always going to make good decisions. And even if you agree with them now, uh, there is a very good chance that that power is going to fall into the hands of somebody that you do not agree with. And then what are you going to do? Unfortunately, this is a problem that we see too often uh, rather than not. And it's not just limited to websites. It's also that routers are, are left inaccessible, uh, that governments very often turn access to just simple basic services like DNS off or curtail DNS requests or uh, get a notification when someone does try to access something that they shouldn't be trying to access uh, just by like harvesting DNS information. So. Um, I think that we have a much wider problem um, because as we move to newer protocols, different things like DNS over HTTPS, it's not that we've fixed the problem, we've just potentially moved the hand that holds the power. Absolutely. What do you think about like new protocols? Is there any way to make this stuff more equitable? I mean, you know, I'm a big fan of the Fediverse. The, the whole idea that we're going to we're going to go, we're going to federate things, we're going to move, uh, we're going to sort of uh, decentralize power as much as possible, let a thousand flowers. Um, having said that, uh, it is a uh, <laughs> it is both a plan and a philosophy that comes with its own set of problems. Uh, so there there is no silver bullet. There's nothing that's going to fix everything. Uh, every time we have to go and like look over the protocol, we have to worry about the security, we have to worry about the privacy, and we have to talk about whether or not power is uh, is focused in the hands of too few people. We need to talk about consequences and accountability and uh, and abuse. Uh, one of the biggest problems that I've seen with people who you know create new protocols or uh, for that matter, create new platforms or you know apps or anything like that is they don't spend a lot of time thinking about how their uh, how their product or protocol or platform is uh, is going to be used in an abuse situation, whether it is an abusive former spouse uh, or it's an abusive government. And, and, you know, kind of talking about that for a moment, like you also work with the Freedom of the Press Foundation and it sounds amazing, but I can imagine that, you know, also here, there's so much happening uh, today around uh, how journalism is being impacted in terms of the internet and the, the face of what is real and what is not and all these allegations around fake news, not only just understanding what legitimate sources of information are, but also being able to propagate them across these censorship resistant uh, areas. So what are some of the main projects you're involved uh, with uh, in this organization? Uh, well, uh, Freedom of Press Foundation doesn't work that much on disinformation issues, uh, but what they do work on is uh, the protection of journalists for doing journalism, uh, because it's really not uncommon these days to see uh, journalists reporting the news uh, being brought up on charges by local governments uh, for doing just that. Because good journalism speaks truth to power. It pisses power off. And uh, if as a result of pissing power off, power decides that you know, what you are doing is illegal and you should be, you know, you should be sent to jail or you should be sent to, to court, that's really one of the one of the areas where the Freedom of Press uh, Foundation steps in. Freedom of Press Foundation also works on a bunch of tools and uh, does uh, trainings for journalists uh, so that they can do a better job of protecting their sources, because one of the uh, biggest problems that journalists face is pressure from governments or whoever it is that they're you know, speaking to truth to power against uh, to reveal their sources. And uh, source protection is incredibly important. So uh, also the, you know, safe communications, safe moving of files, all of this sort of thing, protecting uh, security and anonymity. Um, and they have a, a couple of different products that they use for that. One of them is a uh, an app called Secure Drop, uh, which allows you to run a website uh, where a potential uh, sort of uh, 
whistleblower can show up and drop a bunch of files uh, and can be certain that they will remain anonymous and that they're going to the website and that they're leaving the files uh, will not uh, reveal who they are. Uh, so that's a, an extremely important service. And all of those tools are also uh, free and open source. I love this. Um, this reminds me also of the work that's done by the Oslo Freedom Forum. I'm not sure if you work with them, but I mean, what are the other things that security researchers and uh, specialists can do to kind of help and aid these efforts? Are there things that are gaps uh, that they could potentially fill or things that they could help with? Well, um, the good news for security researchers, we're never going to run out of things to do. Um, one of the one of the things that happens to me a lot is I, I get asked, you know, what can we do as security researchers? You know, I have a very particular set of skills, they tell me in the Liam Neeson voice. And <laughs> I tell them that everybody has a community that they care about and that they know uh, that everybody has, you know, a family or, you know, people who report on issues that they care about or, uh, you know, a, a church or a mosque or a temple or a coven that they're super into or a school and um, that those communities need help. They're often being surveilled uh, by, by governments, by law enforcement, by uh, predatory companies and corporations. Uh, and that reaching out to these communities and seeing what they're concerned about and uh, figuring out ways to protect them is really one of the ways in which security researchers can use their skills for the greater good uh, instead of to, to enrich people who are already very powerful. Thank you so much for your time, Ava, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. If anybody wants to hear more about the aha moments from other amazing hackers, please stay tuned to our next episode.